On behalf of Crossroads Cultural Center, it is a pleasure to welcome you here tonight to our event, Discovering Flannery O'Connor, The Grace Through the Limit, a presentation on the life and leading concerns of Flannery O'Connor. Crossroads Cultural Center was established in 2004 by members of Communion and Liberation, a movement in the Catholic Church who shared an interest in the relationship between religion and culture. Crossroads seeks to explore the ways in which Christianity, by revealing the ultimate meaning of reality, gives new impulse to the human desire for knowledge. In preparing for this evening's presentation, we considered how Christianity reveals the method in which Christ reaches us, namely, in the mystery of the Incarnation, the Word becomes flesh. The stories of Flannery O'Connor reveal this same method because people encounter grace through very concrete, fragile realities. Why does O'Connor insist so much on the limits of people who are so unwillingly the instrument of grace? To discover better the life and work of Flannery O'Connor, we invited Ralph Wood, University Professor of Theology and Literature at Baylor University. Dr. Wood holds degrees from East Texas State College, now Texas A&M University Commerce, as well as a master's and PhD from the University of Chicago. Dr. Wood previously taught at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where he served as the John Allen Easley Professor of Religion from 1990. At Baylor, Dr. Wood teaches in the Great Text Program, as well as the Departments of Religion and English. In addition to being editor-at-large for the Christian Century, he serves on the editorial boards of both the Flannery O'Connor Review and Seven, an Anglo-American Literary Review. He is the author of several books, including The Comedy of Redemption, Christian Faith and Comic Vision in Four American Novelists, Flannery O'Connor and the Christ Haunted South, and Chesterton, the Nightmare Goodness of God. Finally, Dr. Wood will participate in a roundtable discussion at the International Conference on Flannery O'Connor and the Mystery of Place in Dublin, Ireland this summer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ralph Wood. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm honored that Natalie would have the temerity <clears throat> to invite this, um, what I call, Catholico-Baptist or Bapto-Catholic, <laughs> half-breed from Baylor, uh, to talk about the first literary love of my life, Flannery O'Connor. And I hope no one is worried about our small audience. Remember what Milton says in Book One of Paradise Lost? where he predicts I will have a fit audience, though few. <laughs> so, this is a fit audience, though few. Actually, it is maybe a portent of things to come. I was pleased to see that the journal put out by Crossroads uh, featured an issue on Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. Some of you know an important papal letter called The Crisis of Cultures, all of these are online, so they're easy to get a hold of. <clears throat> His Holiness Pope Benedict predicted that, this is a shocking, dark prophecy, that we Christians are a minority from here on in. We are a permanent minority. We're never going to be a majority again. We're never going to run things again. We're not in charge any longer. But rather than lamenting and whining about that, Pope Benedict said, we must take that as a, an occasion for a certain kind of advantage. We're right back where the church began in the first century. And so what he recommends is something like what you fellows, and ladies and gentlemen, are already doing here. He says, we must establish 
radical enclaves of Christian excellence. By which he means not big groups, but small groups across all the denominational lines, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, Pentecostal, joining together in a kind of Christian community that will eventually, of course, mean a shared Eucharist, whereby we are bringing the riches of our own tradition together to form a kind of life and witness to the world that it won't be able to ignore. And so I'm here tonight to suggest that Flannery O'Connor is a way to begin forming that kind of radical Christian community and witness. Because more than any other figure, uh, she's responsible for my being here tonight. In fact, I would go so far to say as this book is responsible for my being here tonight, only an earlier version, which I've already ordered my wife to have buried with me across my <laughs> chest when I die, called a Good Man is Hard to Find, her first collection of short stories published way back in uh, 1955. So what I thought I would do in trying to introduce O'Connor to you and talk with you about a couple of her stories and then engage you, as we had a wonderful time at dinner tonight, engage about some of O'Connor's stories for you to pummel me with questions mm -hmm. and for me to try to come back and have a conversation with you. What I thought I would do tonight would be to stress um, not a kind of even-handed, you know, Plato to NATO survey of her life, but the high points of her life, especially vis-a-vis -vis her Catholic Christianity. It will help you to know that when she was asked a couple of times of what other kind of Christian she would be if she were not a Roman Catholic, she answered, and her interlocutor had assumed, well, you know, maybe high church Episcopalian, you know, they're liturgical, they're sacramental. Um, maybe even, even Lutheran, though, in revolt against Rome, the Lutherans held on a great deal of Rome. Perhaps uh, high and dry Presbyterians. She said, no. And I'll try to imitate her wonderful Georgia drawl. You can get it on the internet, by the way. She said, no. And I'll try to use her a good grammar. If I wasn't a Roman Catholic, I'd be a Pentecostal holiness. <laughs> we may have to explain to our dear Maria what a Pentecostal holiness is. Uh, anyone know what they are besides me? That's okay. We have a, a West we have a West Texas Baptist who threw up. <laughs> uh, who can tell you? But I'll I'll tell you. Let him offer amendments. Uh, by definition, these are people who stress the gifts of the Spirit, mainly, of course, not only the laying on of hands and healing, and not only the speaking in tongues, but what other Pentecostal traditions don't emphasize, they do. Snake handling and the drinking of poisons as proof that they are so filled with the Spirit that even when the rattlers bite them, they will not die. They do not seek any kind of help. They get snake bitten. When they drink serious kinds of poisons, they don't go to the doctor and get purged. They simply live it. You see her point? Her point is this. If you're going to be a Christian, you had better be a radical Christian or not one at all. No one has been able to trace down this saying for her from, from her, though I think it surely is hers, that she revised the Gospel of John when it says, you shall know the truth. Someone said that's present on this campus, a University of Texas campus somewhere. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. To read, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you odd. <laughs> See, for her, once again, to be Christian is to be literally off-center to have a center other than what the world has. That center, of course, being Christ. So by definition, <clears throat> for her, Christians are odd wives. And that's what the Pope is saying. We've got to admit we're different. Thank you for sitting at the front. You're not a Baptist because you were sat in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> um, for O'Connor, to be Christian is to be radically Christian. So in another saying of hers I gave away at the supper table was this. She said, I am a Catholic 
not the way someone else would be a Baptist or a Methodist, but the way someone else would be an atheist. And you get the point again. Atheists are God botherers. Atheists cannot forgive God for not existing. And so they're whining and griping and advertising all the time there is no God in a kind of overcompensation for a belief that's nervous. So O'Connor's a radical Christian. So let me quickly trace the contour of her life to show how that radical Catholic Christianity developed. Uh, she's born in uh, Savannah, Georgia in 1925. Savannah is a coastal city, very much like New Orleans, Charleston, uh, and other southern cities where there was a large influx of Catholic immigrants, especially from Italy on the one hand and from Ireland on the other. And of course, with a name like O'Connor, what could you be but Irish Catholic? Uh, she was raised there in Savannah. You can visit her home. Anyone happen to visit O'Connor's home? You need to make your pilgrimage west, east of the Mississippi. There's so much lying beyond the Great River. Um, she, she lived not far from the cathedral. She attended the cathedral school. She said, I was educated by Irish nuns just off the boat. And she said, when you didn't get your sums right, you got thumped behind the ear. You know, these were not modern teachers who would be accused of child abuse if they did that. But already she's a kind of rebellious young Catholic. For example, when she was told that she had a guardian angel, she wasn't at all happy about that. She said, I don't need anybody guarding me. And so she would have these kind of uh, uh, shadow boxing fights where she'd fight off her guardian <laughs> angel. So she doesn't want to be known, this is important, as a traditional pious Catholic. Already as a young child, she wants to be a Catholic with a difference. And I, I made this distinction at the dinner table tonight that might help you in that matter. A friend of mine at Notre Dame says there are two kinds of Catholics. Cradle Catholics, C-R-A-D-L-E, those who are born Catholic, reared Catholic, brought up Catholic, because Catholicism is what you do in certain parts of the world, certain regions, even this country. And then Catholicism becomes the background noise, the music of your life, the wallpaper. Then there are Credo Catholics, C-R-E-D-O, the first word, of course, of the creed. I believe Catholic. So you hear the difference? Cradle Catholics, Credo Catholics. Well, though O'Connor was brought up from the cradle as a Catholic, she wanted to be and was a Credo Catholic. She's often mistaken to be a convert, because converts are often you know, the most radical kind of Catholics. No, she's not a convert. She uh, had only one distinguishing mark of that childhood in Savannah, and that is she taught a chicken to walk backwards. <laughs> she raised chickens and she taught this chicken somehow <laughs> to walk in reverse. Now how she did that, I can't imagine. But you see, she's odd. She does things that no one else does. <clears throat> However, there was a kind of dark undercurrent already in Flannery O'Connor's life, even as a young girl of 10, 11, she found herself drawn very much more to her father than to her mother. And that's often the case. Freud helped explain why that's the case, not entirely or sufficiently. But that's all the fact. My hero is my mother. I don't mind telling you that. But it meant for a kind of tension in the family because Mr. O'Connor was a quiet um, sort of fellow, a, a real estate agent. Mrs. O'Connor, Regina, was a noisy, domineering, uh, take charge kind of Catholic, um, the kind that O'Connor did not want to be. But the dark other side is that by the time O'Connor is about 11, her father becomes very ill with lupus erythematosus. Some of you may know that's the Latin word for wolf. I think it's very close in, it, in Italian. What's the word for wolf? Lupo? Yeah. Yeah. It comes, comes from the same group. Lupus. It's a, it's a self-devouring, what we call autoimmune disease, where the body creates antibodies against its own system. 
No one really knows what brings it on. It can be a, a, a huge psychological trauma. It can be something in the environment that we've absorbed, chemically or whatever. It can be a, an inherited predisposition, so beware of what's coming. And he, in fact, dies. Her father dies by the time she's 12. And so they have to leave Savannah and move up to what was the O'Connor, Mrs. O'Connor, Regina Klein's ancestral home called Milledgeville. And I urge you to make your pilgrimage to Milledgeville. If you go to Fatima and if you go to Lourdes and you go to Walsingham, <laughs> you've got to go to Milledgeville. <laughs> it's a remarkable city of about 20,000, but it's a city that in his infamous march to the sea, where General Sherman destroyed everything so as to make the rebels of the Confederacy never try to do it again. He spared Milledgeville. He did not burn down, you know, Atlanta, he flattened. He did not burn Milledgeville. And so it remains one of the most remarkable antebellum pre-Civil War towns in the South, full of 19th century homes. O'Connor grew up in one of those homes because her father, was dead, there was no family income, but they had family land and holdings back in Milledgeville. There, of course, there was no parochial school to attend. She had to go to the public schools. But already as a very gifted high school student, uh, graduating at, I think, 15, um, she is precocious in every regard. She's ahead of the others. She's smart. Let's get over it. There's just <laughs> brains make a difference. She had them as a gift. Watch out for people who brag on their brains, by the way. The story called The Temple of the Holy Ghost is one of her best. It's a version of what Flannery O'Connor was as a young girl, by the way. That's <laughs> Flannery O'Connor, by the way. The unnamed little prepubescent girl is Flannery O'Connor. She's proud of being smart. And that gets her into terrible trouble. Your brains, you don't go out and acquire. You don't work them up. They're a gift. She was smart. And so when she finished high school, someone asked her what she was supposed to, what she wanted to do. She said, I want to be a prose satirist. You have that kind of precocious idea of what you're going to be in life. A prose satirist. In other words, Maria, not one writing poetry, one writing prose either fiction or essays, but above all being a satirist, one who makes fun of, one who deflates, one who picks holes in things that are puffed up and bloated and proud and pretentious. Because she began to see there are things in our world that need a pinprick, right put in them so let the air out. God knows how much we need her now in our own time. We don't have any really good satirists. We have a few. So, the O'Connors are too poor, Mrs. O'Connor, to send her daughter off to Wellesley, the college where she would later have a friend from. She goes to the local community college. She goes to the equivalent of a, what, I don't know what the community college in Austin is, but something like that. It's a women's college there in Milledgeville. Uh, and lives at home. In other words, as cheaply as she could, 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 could uh, manage, she went to college. She did not major in English, by the way, to the surprise of many, because in this college, the English courses were still centered upon the diagramming of sentences and the declension of verbs. Now those are both very good things to do, but not at the college level. So she majored instead in the social sciences, psychology, sociology, political science, anthropology. Here comes the first big surprise. She would say later, thank God it didn't take. <laughs> take is our word for an inoculation that works. So she got inoculated with the social sciences and she said, thank God it didn't take. So beware of the statistical world. 
Beware of things that can be predicted by surveys. Beware of testing as a means for finding out really who you are. I know people who refuse to take the Myers-Briggs inventory on just those grounds. It pins you as this or that. And there are after you're fixed. So, she begins to poke fun as a college student. She's editor of the college journal, magazine. Uh, she pokes fun of two things. Interestingly, she has a prophetic eye of what's going to come onto the scene as the new idols of our time. She makes fun of the automobile. She sees it's about to become the American God idol, the thing that Americans worship. Watch out for her novel, Wise Blood, which centers around a man's automobile in many ways. But she also takes out after the new craze for health, and especially over-the-counter forms of additives and vitamins and all the kind of things we're about. We can become healthy. She begins to see that Americans are wanting to extend their lives longer and longer and longer without making their lives deeper and deeper and deeper. Her favorite over-the-counter medicine, everyone here I think is too young, maybe our friend here to remember, it was Hadakal. Hadakal. He knows what Hadakal was. It was an alleged cure for the common cold. Hear the pun? Had a cold. I once was, had a cold. Now I'm no longer. It had to be 12% wine. <laughs> alcohol. That's why I know. And in my, part of, <laughs> in my part of East Texas, everybody kept colds all the time so they could drink had a call. <laughs> so she sees what's fraudulent behind this whole American desire to stay healthy. I'm giving a writing paper right now, Walker Percy. You must read Love in the Ruins, the funniest book ever written, um, where he says the last sound the average American ever hears is the squish of nurse's shoes going down the hospital hallway. Isn't that a horrible image? That's how we die. We stay alive longer, longer, longer than to have a doctor between our legs and not know who we are. She wins a full scholarship then in journalism, which she thinks to be her satirical career, at the University of Iowa. Now for our Italian guests and others, Iowa is a Midwestern state. <laughs> and Midwestern states are, um, what shall I say without being impolite? <laughs> <laughs> Percy makes really wicked fun of Ohio and love in the ruins. I won't tell you how he does so. It's naughty, but it's still, therefore, very funny. Well, Iowa is a kind of, a, what shall I say, can-do state. The motto of Iowa is, if it's broken, if it's broken, God darn it, fix it. In other words, every human problem has a human answer. Which, of course, is patently untrue. Most things broken can't be fixed. In fact, Flannery O'Connor's great worry is that in our utilitarian world, where everything is built around fixing things, we delude ourselves into thinking we're really finding health, wholeness, and the like. But she's happy as a lark there. She, um, after one semester, because her first semester as a journal, journalism student is miserable. <coughs> Who, what, when, where, why? The five journalistic questions. She said, bored me to death. I wanted to write about what makes people tick. I wanted to write fiction. So she goes over and applies to and is admitted to the very famous creative writing workshop run by a man named Paul Engel at the University of Iowa, where she becomes the star. She wins all of the awards. Um, and by the way, her prayer journal, kept during those first two years at Iowa, has just been published. Get thee to a bookstore to get it. Flannery O'Connor's prayer journal. 
I've reviewed it, and if you get my card, I'll give you my for you get my review. All first things. Um, she's happy not only because she's in her own element, but because she doesn't have to wear a skirt all the time. So these Iowans are practical. They know that women in cold weather are going to have on pants. She liked it because uh, she didn't have to be nice all the time. You know, the southern motto is, be nice. Don't give anybody any offense. Don't upset anybody. She also loved it because she could be thoroughly Catholic there. And here's a moment that I would have all of you young people remember. She went to Mass daily for three solid years and never met the priest in charge of the parish. And it didn't bother her a whit. She said, I wasn't there to meet people. I wasn't there to make friends. No, she had friends at the university. I was there to receive our Lord's broken body and shed blood. And then she added, and I didn't go there to feel anything. She said, if you go to Mass to feel something, you're going for the wrong reason. You're going there to receive the sacramental gift that will have long-lasting, undiscernible ways of working itself out in your life. Not because you feel good all the time. She loved it. When she finished Iowa, she then went to um, a famous writer's colony in uh, upstate New York. Uh, again, where she met famous people and did very good work, spending her time writing hard. But after that, she went to live in New York City for a very short time uh, at the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association. It's just one level above a flop house. <laughs> it's not as good as the youth hostels of Europe, the YWCA. She said it was so cold in there that some people put copies of the New York Times down their pajama legs <laughs> to stay warm at night. <laughs> and she said there was one Southern writer who was so poor there in New York City, that he used his coffee grounds over and over and over again until they turned white and then served them as grits. Oh. <laughs> You've taught Maria what grits are. Good. But then comes, then comes the, the, the life-changing moment. She's invited to um, a highfalutin dinner party hosted by Robert Lowell who was then one of the most famous Catholic converts and outstanding poets um, in this country. Um, it was attended by, among other people, a woman named Mary McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Most of you haven't heard of her. She was quite a big figure. It's about 1952. Oh, two. About right. Yeah, about 1952. And at this dinner party, Mary McCarthy um, had just published a book called Memoirs of a Catholic Childhood, whose basic premise was, here is how I outgrew the Catholic Church. This is how the Catholic Church proved to be just too small and confining to me. But then she made a fatal mistake. She said, however, though I don't believe any of that hocus pocus, which by the way is the Latin, that word derives from the Latin, hoc, uh, hoc es corpus meum. This is my body. Hocus pocus. I still find Eucharist, Eucharistic symbolism useful for my fiction. For after all, when you mention bread and wine in a story, it has a kind of cultural relevance. It has a kind of ambiance that people pick up and know something must be important going on here. Though, of course, I'm using it only as a symbol. Well, Flannery O'Connor was not a hale woman well met. She did not make conversation easily. She did not even like eye contact. She never spoke unless spoken to. And by the way, remember what Bill Buckley said about New York dinner parties. He said, if you mention God at a New York dinner party, people will stare at you. 
And if you mention God twice at a New York dinner party, party, you won't be invited back. Well, God had been mentioned. The Eucharist is just useful, a useful symbol. Flannery O'Connor rose to the edge of her chair. And in an unforgettable single declaration, she said, <clears throat> I'll try to use her voice. If the Holy Eucharist is only a symbol, then I say to hell with it. <laughs> Got it. Either this is the world's magnetic center, the place where the incarnation comes to its climactic moment, the death and resurrection of our Lord, reenacted upon the altars of his church, for life eternal, life immortal, life new and fresh is provided. Or else it's a fraud. It's a hoax. It's something you ought to make fun of. You shouldn't use it as a symbol. You should say, that's Christian crap. It's either or for O'Connor. So watch out where we're going. All of her stories push you to an either or. See, most of us want to stay in a safe middle where things don't threaten, where we can be easy Christians or easy sectors. It doesn't matter. We don't want to be pushed to the extremes. That's exactly what O'Connor does. Well, at this dinner party, she meets a couple named Robert and Sally Fitzgerald. He is the poet in residence at Yale, and she is a woman uh, who's a gifted writer herself and the mother of about nine children. You know, they're good, devout Catholics. And they discover she's living at the Y, Robert and Sally Fitzgerald. That O'Connor's living at the Y. They know what a hellhole that is. So they say, why don't you come live with us? They had a garage apartment and help us, you know, change diapers 40 times a day, <laughs> feed these babies, and, you know, you'll be able then to spend your afternoons writing. We'll gather for cocktails and dinner and evening discussion of great ideas and books. She said, of course, wonderful. So she went. And there she had a wonderful, wonderful uh, life renewing experience with the Fitzgeralds. It was there that she finished the uh, final drafts of her first novel, Wise Blood. I've discovered that some of you have seen the movie of that, and maybe you've read the book. Uh, among other things, I urge that the last book you read is Wise Blood, and the last story you read is A Good Man is Hard to Find. <laughs> Most people start with those. That's where you ought to end. But as she worked at her typewriter, old-fashioned manuals, her arms began to grow incredibly heavy at the typewriter. She couldn't work for more than about 15 minutes without total exhaustion. She had been all of these years writing her mother a daily postcard, going back every Christmas to spend with her mother in Milledgeville, Georgia. And so in the winter Christmas of 1950, she took the train back from Connecticut to Atlanta in Milledgeville and grew deathly ill on that train. The enduring chill picks up that very event. After six weeks in uh, Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta, you all know where the story's going, it's discovered she has lupus erythematosus. Probably inherited as a genetic predisposition from her father. And, of course, this means a total change in everything. She will not be able to live away from Georgia, away from Milledgeville. She'll spend the rest of her life at home. And she did not want to live at home, let's be honest. O'Connor knew she was a Georgian through and through. She loves the locality of her region. Uh, she used to say, um, you ain't nobody unless you are from somewhere, F-R-U-M. <laughs> but she wanted to write at a certain critical distance from her southern milieu. Because 
How many of you grew up in a small southern town? I bet my wife and I are the only two people here. Three, four, one. Uh, Odessa doesn't qualify, but no. We're up in between small towns. Okay. Life in a small town can be suffocating. Absolutely suffocating. So then I knew, so then I knew a lady who had been the wife of a Baptist minister in eastern North Carolina, and they had moved every other year from one small Baptist church to another in eastern North Carolina. Because you know, if we Baptists keep a pastor the third year, we make him pastor emeritus. <laughs> so we <laughs> should keep one more than a year. So someone said to her, how did you stand it living in all those little suffocating small southern towns? She said, oh, no problem. They said, because nothing ever happens there. She said, that's right. Nothing ever happens there. But what you hear makes up for it. <laughs> gossip. 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 Well, O'Connor did not want to be the subject of gossip. She did not want people prying into her life all the time and saying, hey, there goes Larry O'Connor for the life. In Austin, you want people to say that, but not in, <laughs> not in, uh, in Millersville, Georgia. That wasn't going to happen. She was going to be back home under her mother's thumb the rest of her life. And so she spent the last 14 years of her life, 1960 until 1950 until 1964, dying of lupus erythematosus there in Milledgeville. She said, I thought the return home would be the death of me, creatively, exactly like, of course, the figure you encountered in The Enduring Chill. She said, I thought all imaginative life would be squashed out of me by being under my smother mother. And to give you an indication of how Mrs. O'Connor Regina was a smother mother, my great Catholic hero, my professor at East Texas State, Paul Barabas, brought Flannery O'Connor to East Texas State, this little Cal Patty College, for her only Texas visit, 1962, two years before her death. She invited them, him to come and visit the, her and her mother in Millersville. So he took them up on it one summer. And when he, they, she had served, they spent the afternoon on the porch talking. And about 5 o'clock, Flatter said, we're going in for the service of benediction, uh, sometimes called adoration. It's a service where the mass is not said. But of course, the consecrated host is placed in a pix, and one there adores it, sings Thomas's, uh, St. Thomas's great hymn to the Eucharist and the like. And he, being a devout Catholic convert, said, surely I would. It'd be an honor. But O'Connor was a typical pointy-headed intellectual who couldn't park a bicycle straight, and therefore never learned how to drive. So Mrs. O'Connor had to drive her daughter, Flannery, and my professor, Barris, in the village room. Because by this time, O'Connor could not negotiate stairs in the antebellum home in Milledgeville. They lived out about four miles on a farm where her mother ran a dairy farm. And so, Mrs. O'Connor, Regina Klein, pulled up in front of the Catholic Church to let Flannery out and my professor out. Flannery was on crutches. He assumed that she might go to the rear of the church and park the car and then join them. Instead, Mrs. O'Connor said, y'all go pray while I get the groceries. <laughs> you get the point? She is a practical woman. She is a woman who has what the French call savoir-faire. She knows how to make things do. She can run a dairy farm. The service of benediction or adoration, well, if you want to do that, I guess that's okay. That's not what I, as a Catholic, care about. So Connor dreaded going back home and being in that kind of world. And yet she underwent a fundamental revelation upon returning. And here it is. I've never written this up because I can't prove it, but I think it's for sure the case. O'Connor was a very great lover of Dostoevsky especially his greatest novel, The Brothers, Karamazov. Again, books to read before I die. That one should be at the top. 
you all have your books, books to read before you die? Mine gets longer every day. <laughs> I'm 71, so look what a crunch I'm in. <laughs> she read that book. Mark learned, inwardly digested it, and began to ponder it, I think. That's a book about four young brothers of an old man named Theodore Karamazov. So Dostoevsky gives his own name to the most despicable character in the book. He is a, a wretched uh, alcoholic. He is a um, womanizer. He has his kept mistress. He has fathered an illegitimate child on the village prostitute. He is no good. He is worse than worthless. In fact, when his first wife dies, he goes out and sings the Te Deum, thanking God that he's at last rid of that bitch. I mean, he's disgusting. And the brothers, therefore, have good grounds for wishing him dead. And one of them not only wishes him dead, one of them kills him. I won't give it away by telling you whom, because that's the heart of the novel, figure out who kills him and for what reason. But here is the kind of deep undergirding thesis that emerges from that great novel. And here's the only time I would have had a board behind me, but you'd get it. My formulaic, formulaic way of putting the Brothers Karamazov is to say, for Dostoevsky, parasite, P-A-R-R-A-C-I-D-E, equals deicide, D-E-I-C-I-D-E. The killing of the parent is the equivalent of the killing of God. And of course, Dostoevsky means that in all of the ways in which you can kill a parent. You have to have a gun or a knife or a rope. We kill our parents by stuffing them in nursing homes, which is probably a death worse than a knife or a gun. We warehouse them where they rot. They become senile almost immediately after entering nursing homes because they, the average American nursing home resident gets one visit per year, per year. I think O'Connor came to see, look, here I am, a devout Catholic, a Catholic committed to making my art serve the glory of God and his church, to be a radical, uncompromising, unembarrassed, unapologetic Christian. And yet, here I am, eaten up with what may be the primal sin. Scorn for my mother. Because Dostoevsky's point in saying parasite equals deicide is to say this. We stand in the immediate relation to our parents as we stand in ultimate relation to God. You can't see God can't know God directly, you see your parent, you know your parent, and your parents are not always nice, as God is not always nice. Read the book of Job. <laughs> Listen to our Lord's cry, Gethsemane. Let this cup pass from me. And yet, and therefore, to kill the parent by whatever spiritual, psychological means, is to kill God. So how we treat the immediate at hand parent is how we treat our own parent. And so I think she underwent a radical kind of conversion, which is to say repentance. That's what the word conversion means. So watch out. In all of her stories, the people to have suspicion about are not those smother mothers who stay at home to take care of their sons and daughters, most of whom are failed writers, but the other way around. The real villains are the smart daughters who have PhDs in philosophy, or the smart sons who are professional writers. O'Connor's way of saying, they're the Dostoevsky, God killers, because they're killing their parents. 
And so she spent those last 14 years dying in a remarkably redemptive way. I'm teaching this course called the 20th Century Catholic Revival, just finished it. And though it included only about three weeks on O'Connor, I had the students in that class read ten, uh, one letter of O'Connor every night in her volume called The Habit of Being her collected letters. And I can assure you, to use a good Catholic phrase, if you want to save your soul, read one O'Connor letter per night. They're funny. They're poignant. They are acutely critical. And they're often very acerbically self-critical. She points her irony, her satire, back at herself. One of my favorite cartoons she drew as an undergraduate is that of a the, 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 the prom, the formal dance of the senior year, where you can imagine uh, she envisions all of the gents in their tuxedos, all of the ladies in their formal gowns. They're all dancing, you know, sweeping across the floor. Over in one corner sits a wallflower, not a very attractive girl. Wallflower is one who nobody asked for a date. Scowling, obviously, family of our say, oh, well, I can always be a PhD. <laughs> My students tell me, if you want to know, if you want to understand your professors, remember, they're the people nobody wanted to dance with in high school. <laughs> and I still can't dance, by the way. My wife's a good dancer. <laughs> so she's laughing at herself in these letters. But she's also not smiling to heaven, saying, oh, thank you, Lord, for giving me lupus that I might die at age 39. On the contrary. One of the most poignant letters consists of five words. I'm sick of being sick. Because she was sick more or less all the time. She had to take massive doses of cortisone. As you know, cortisone just relieves you temporarily. It destroys. She died of actually kidney disease from the cortisone, not from lupus. But in, I think, the best of her letters, she says, I can take it all, it being dying young. She said, I will never be a little old lady in tennis shoes. <laughs> a nice pointed phrase. I can take it all as a blessing with one eye squinted. Yeah, yeah, maybe. That's faith. That's real faith. Not bitching, I didn't deserve this. Not piously praising God gave me this great gift, but saying, it's mine. Let me offer it up to Christ to participate in his own suffering. And so she died in 1964 at the age of 39, having written two novels, two collections of short stories, one book of essays, plus this huge, wonderful volume of letters. Thank God there was no email. We would not have had O'Connor's letter. So, fire questions, please. Mm -hmm. Speak loudly because I have ears to hear and hear not. Because yeah. you said not to start with us two. Yes. What do you Good recommend question. to start with? And I said, don't begin, don't begin with Wise Blood, her first novel, or Good Man is Hard to Find, her signature story. I almost left. Because what she calls the moment of grace, the moment of conversion, the moment of turning, is so subtle there that one is like to miss, likely to miss it. Instead, begin with Revelation, a very funny story, but also a very typical story. And unlike most other stories, nobody gets killed. <laughs> but I warned my supper mates when I quoted O'Connor to them when I said, she often liked to say, yeah, a lot of people in my stories get killed, but don't nobody get hurt. <laughs> By which she means nobody gets tortured, nobody gets put through a, a grinding mill, but they come to their moments of grace during and in the midst of their death. Yes, sir? I think it's related to your discussion sure. of Flannery O'Connor. The other, in your, in your course, you're teaching on 20th century... Catholic authors. Who are some of the others that you uh, Okay, he's asking about what other authors I teach. The basis for the course is a great book from 1935 
called simply Catholicism by Henri de Lubac, a very great Catholic theologian silenced by the Vatican before being brought back in and made a cardinal, um, who was the teacher of Balthazar, who was the friend of uh, Henri Tanielou, of the former Cardinal Ratzinger, etc., etc. It's a great, magnificent summary declaration of what Catholicism is as an extension of the early church and not as a leap over the early church. So it picks up all the great patristic authors from those first thousand years of the church's life. And then we read through, um, since it's a course taught in this country, Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, Flannery O'Connor. By the way, there is the beginning of an effort to canonize Flannery O'Connor uh, by, by uh, uh, a dentist in Atlanta, who might have met. Walker Percy, uh, across the pond to Evelyn Wall. Bribes had revisited, maybe the greatest Catholic novel of the 20th century. Graham Greene, The End of the Affair, by far his best novel. Then over to Bernardos uh, in France. If time permits, of course, there's so many wonderful Frenchmen. Mariac, um, Maritain, Claudel, so forth. And then we wind up with the last two papal encyclicals devoted to the question of birth and death, Humanae Vitae and Evangelium Vitae. We begin with those. You can see why I'm never bored. <laughs> and the privilege of teaching texts like that, I get on my knees for and say, no way I could deserve that. What kind of Baylor students take your course? Um, kind of Baylor students to take my course. Let me answer by pointing out, first of all, what a lot of people don't know. And that is that Baylor is now 12% Roman Catholic, the largest Catholic university in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly bigger than St. Mary's in Houston, in uh, San Antonio and St. Thomas in Houston. I'm sure it's bigger than St. Edward's. I don't know what St. Edward's is. So we have... Um, well over 2,500 Catholic students. There's a Catholic parish next to the campus, St. Peter's, full-time Catholic priest, um, Chinese, a wonderful cadre of Catholic faculty, including the founding dean of our Honors College, Tom Gibbs, whom we stole from Boston College as chair of philosophy. And these Catholics are not our honored guests who we treat nicely. They are full citizens of our community, full plate. Uh, in fact, my Catholic friends say, we are freer at Baylor than we are at most Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, we had a study of Fides et Ratio. Um, a bunch of us, Catholics and Protestants together, met for about a semester once a week. And my friend Tom Hibbs said, for this discussion to have occurred in Boston, we would have had to find an, an attic apartment with someone standing outside with an AK-47 <laughs> guarding it. <laughs> because I was just astonished. When, 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 when Benedict was elected, we all went around campus giving each other high fives. Habemus Papam! Habemus Papam! We have a Pope. I began to lecture on Catholic campuses. Oh, they got this god awful, terrible Rottweiler mm -hmm. as a pope. In other words, Bader is Catholic friendly. Bader has a, 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 a really significant Catholic presence. My students are still overwhelmingly Protestant, but I have Catholics in all of my classes now. Because Catholics, now not only Catholics, but a lot of, we have a 34% minority population of Baylor, with no minority affairs office. Amazing. We just say, come, and they come. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, one of my favorite books is 
favorite stories is Parker's Back. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I really like it for the, you know, the character of, of Parker and how he's always been um, just attracted to beautiful things mm -hmm. and the tattoos. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the questions uh, I've always had is why the, the Christian character, his wife, Sarah Ruth, mm -hmm. she's unable to recognize the face of Christ mm -hmm. right, on, on his back. And so I, I just wanted to know if you could yeah. say a little bit about that. Yes. The question that Natalie's asking is larger than the story of Parker's back. That was O'Connor's last completed story. It may be the nearest thing she ever wrote to a perfect story. In fact, the secular New York Jewish critic, Alfred Kazin, called it just that. He said, if there is a perfect story in English, it's this one. And then he added, imagine a secular Jew, not observant Jew, say, and for her to be dead at 39 is an outrage. That's a Jew talking about a Catholic life. Here's what O'Connor says about the larger question of her relation to Protestant characters and the Protestant world to her own Catholicism. She said, I am drawn to these folk Christians of my own region. People who have no desire for any kind of political power. People who are on the margins of society. Not the big steeple First Baptist churches of the towns, but the little backwoods churches. And she would have picked up their lingo, by the way, on the radio. Remember she does before TV, thank God. Mm -hmm. And remember the bad old days when a Catholic entering a Protestant church was in danger of jeopardizing her salvation. So she didn't go in Protestant churches. She didn't hear these things directly. She got them from the newspaper and from she said, they are people of my own heart. They are my kind of people because they have not swallowed the secular pot of message that we can do for ourselves. Their whole idea of Christianity as being a nice kind of civil religion is unthinkable. These are people who take up rattlers, who drink poison, uh, people who are totally sold out to Jesus. I'm with them because they are radical Christians as I want to be. They're radical kind of folk Protestants as I'm trying to be a radical kind of Roman Catholic. However, with one major exception, she said that is the church. They have no sacramental understanding of the church. They do not see the church as the body of Christ. They do not understand that there's no such thing as a solitary Christian. That the only kind of Christian there is, is a Christian fully participating in the body of Christ. Receiving that body in the Eucharist, in the other sacraments, living by Catholic teachings and Catholic ethical practices, because it's not a do-it-yourself religion. She says so often, the Protestant folk Christianity that I depict in my fiction is a do-it-yourself kind of Christianity. You cobble it together afresh every day. But most of them get it right. I'm going to read you a passage in a minute from one who really gets it right. However, if you've never seen a crucifix, you're in trouble. If you've never seen Christ's Pantocrator, the greatest of all of the icons, you're barren. If you've never seen figured on the walls, by the way, I looked around for a crucifix and couldn't find one. Um, if you live in a barren kind of place where your Christianity is what you more or less make up for yourself, you're going to also really miss it. And that's what happens to this woman, Sarah Ruth. She wants nothing to do with the churches.
Because, you see, she is a good anti-institutional American. See, most Americans are suspicious of institutions of any kind. Whereas for O'Connor, life comes through institutions now. Most of them are corrupt. The church is corrupt. But the church is the body of Christ. So let me read to you, as a way of answering your question, a sermon by a 17-year-old folk Protestant Christian, and my favorite story, my friend, The River. Have you read The River? I'll set it up for you. I won't give it away. I'll just set it up for you. It's a story about a young five-year-old boy named Harry Ashfield. Now remember, the most 